And all right, turn with me to Revelation 11 or 12. We got to verse 11 last time. Uh, we've been looking at this ongoing invisible war that's happening between Jesus Christ and Satan. And again, Israel and the Jewish people are caught in the crossfire in this chapter and throughout history, really. Um, remember at the beginning of chapter 12, we saw that the Apostle John was given a great sign, it says, that appeared in heaven. And the interpretation of that great sign was that Israel, the woman, was going to give birth to the Messiah, Jesus, and the dragon was standing by wanting to destroy the child. And um, we saw in verse 4 that word stood means a continual standing by the enemy that's against Israel and the Jewish people. And the simple reason is Satan hates God's chosen people because God chose them to uh, bring about a specific purpose, and that is to bring the Messiah into the world. And one of the primary purposes of Jesus Christ coming into this world was to destroy the works of the devil and ultimately destroy Satan in the lake of fire. That's at least a thousand years from now when that happens. So that's why Satan has always wanted to destroy the Jewish people. First, he wanted to prevent the Messiah from coming into the world because salvation would come through Jesus. But then secondly, he wants to annihilate the Jews even presently because if he was successful, then God's promises of an eternal covenant that he has made with the Jews would be made null and void. But God has the final say. Jesus Christ has prevailed. He defeated Satan on the cross, but Satan at this point is too arrogant to realize it. A day is coming when Satan and all of his followers will be destroyed once and for all. And we'll see in Revelation 20, they will end up in the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. In the meantime, uh, Satan and all the demons are doing all they can to try and steal, kill, and destroy as many people as they can, trying to trip you up as a believer, even though they have no authority over us any longer, but he still wants to try and trip you up and you know neutralize your witness for Christ. But the Word of God exhorts us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, look at this verse. This is for you and I as saints. Starting in verse 8, Peter writes, Be sober, that means self-controlled. Be vigilant, that means watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And so this will never be more true when... Satan is kicked out of heaven once and for all. We saw this in chapter 12, verse 9. Satan and his demons will no longer have any access to God. He will no longer be able to bring his lying accusations against us before the Lord. But as we'll see in a moment, this will be really bad news for those on planet Earth during the Great Tribulation because Satan knows his time is short and he will do all that he can to try and steal, kill, and destroy people on this planet. So, as we'll see here in a moment, this invisible war comes to earth, and um, the Jews, though, at the end, will realize Jesus is their Messiah. They'll understand the truth about the Antichrist. But before we look at that, uh, let's look at verse 10, chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Uh, most of this message is going to focus on chapter 11. We just read through it last week, but there's so much for all of us to heed here in verse 11. Verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, this is after Satan gets the boot once and for all, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And... They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So first of all, the they, who were the they here? And they overcame him by, it refers in verse, um, back to our brethren in verse 10. It's referring to the tribulation saints who are suffering martyrdom at the hands of the Antichrist. But the way they overcome Satan is true for all of us. It's been true for 
Christians for the last 2,000 years. We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we don't love our lives even to the death. And so we're going to look at these three things. First of all, notice it says there in verse 11, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. This simply means that the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross is the only acceptable payment for our sins. His blood is what purchased you off the slave market of sin. It's because of his blood that we are no longer under the wrath of God Almighty because the blood of Jesus has not only covered our sins, he's washed our sins away from us. And so the blood of the Lamb is how we overcome. Standing on the truth that you are a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away, behold, all things become new. It's the blood of the Lamb. It's so important. So look, look at these verses. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And in the Greek, the, the word cleanses there means it's an ongoing present tense cleansing. His blood continually cleanses us of all sin. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. We've been purchased from that slave market of sin. That's what redemption means. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And so I heard it years ago, someone say, we're like, we're like Teflon Christians when it comes to the attacks, the lies, the accusations of Satan they don't, uh, they don't stick to us because of the blood of Jesus upon our lives. He can bring all kinds of lies, accusations against you, and they might even be true, but they don't stick because we are covered by the blood of Jesus. If we did not have the blood of Jesus upon our lives, we would all be uh, guilty as charged. You know, Satan has a list of sins that I've committed, and you could roll that list right down the you know, out there to the street. <laughs> and Satan would say, yeah, this is what Jeff did. This is who he is. This is blah, blah. And I'd say, yep, that's who I was before Jesus saved me. But I don't need to listen to any accusations because everything I've done, it's all covered by the blood. It's all washed away because of the blood of Jesus. We are guilty as charged, but that changed when Jesus came into our lives. Not only did he wash our sins away, but he has put his robes of righteousness around us. I hope you understand that. That's why Jesus came. He took our place on the cross because he didn't deserve to go to the cross. We do because we sinned, we rebelled, but he willingly went to the cross and took upon himself the wrath, the judgment that we deserve for our sins. And so we read verses like this, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, for he made him, the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. So that's on the cross. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that means when God the Father looks down upon you, he doesn't see you as the lost sinner, the, the wicked sinner, you know, the horrible loser, the, you know, children of wrath. He doesn't see us that way any longer, but because he sees the blood of Jesus, he sees the righteousness of Christ wrapped around us, he sees you now as his son, his daughter, his child, because Jesus paid the price. You are now a new creation in Christ. Second Corinthians 5.17, you know this verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and you see that phrase a lot by Paul, in Christ or in him, that's your position. You are in Christ. Because you are in Christ, he is a new creation. That's how the Father sees you. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so we overcome the enemy's accusations against us, Again, by holding fast to the truth that his blood has washed away all of our sins. He has cleansed us of all of our wickedness, all of our sinful behavior, all of our, our sin nature. We're a new creation in Christ. 
Now, as a warning for us as Christians, don't use the grace of God and your position in Christ as an excuse to go out and sin against the Lord. There's way too many Christians, or well, maybe so-called Christians, I can't tell, only God knows, but there are many people who wrongly believe, oh, I'm a new creation in Christ, so I can go out and sin as much as I want, and God will forgive me. I'll just live for the world, the flesh, and the devil, and I'm you know, going to hold on to that verse, I'm a new creation in Christ. Well, are you really? I don't know. There's a, there's a fine line between a professing Christian, remember what Jesus says? There'll be those, many of those who will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a, that's a professing Christian. And there's a possessing Christian. We're not perfect, but we belong to Jesus. We still make mistakes because none of us are perfect this side of heaven, but we're a new creation in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit, when he comes into our lives and upon our lives, when we start to do things that are wrong, he will convict us. But it's always with the intention of drawing us back to Jesus. When we sin and the, the enemy brings condemnation upon your life for sinning, he's always trying to push you away from God. Oh, you blew it again? God doesn't love you anymore. You know, God doesn't want to hear from you. You don't listen to those things. If you're convicted when you sin, you'll want to run to the loving arms of Jesus. If you're a backslidden Christian like the prodigal son, you end up in the pig pen. Oh, man, if I just go back to my father, maybe he'll take me back as one of his slaves. You know the story. No, the father saw him coming, ran out to him, threw his arms around him. My son who was lost is found. It was his son, still his son, but now he's back in that relationship. God created you for close, personal, intimate relationship. Uh, John, the author of Revelation, says in 1 John that we love God because he first loved us. He initiated it. He started this whole process. We simply respond to the love of God. But what kind of relationship would you have with someone if they said, you know what, we're married, but I'm just going to go and sin and sleep around and commit all this sexual immorality. Elizabeth would not be very happy in our relationship if I did that. Guaranteed. So, don't use your, the grace of God as an excuse for sin. Paul says to the Romans, Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. You were set free from sin. You weren't set free so you could continue to live in sin. So be careful. We have the blood of Jesus. That is how we have victory. We overcome the enemy's lies because of the blood of Christ. Now, how do we break that pattern of habitual sin as a Christian? If you are a Christian and you're still slipping into the same old patterns of sin, then you need to genuinely confess your sin. Confession means to agree with God. I agree with God all the time because my mind will go in all kinds of weird directions. You got to bring those thoughts back into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we confess, we agree with God. Lord, what I just did, I can't believe I did it or I said that, I did something hurtful or whatever it might be, you simply confess it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess or agree with God our sins, yeah, God, what you say is right, what I did was wrong, so I confess that to you. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't ever think of that as, oh, I got to get re-saved. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about relationship. You want to have a close, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. So you want to just make sure you keep all that junk away. And if you get caught up in it, push it away again and get close to the Lord. It's not for salvation. It's for relationship. Secondly, after confession is repentance. As Christians, it's not a one-time deal when you repent and you turn away. Now you're living for Jesus. I still need to turn away from things when you get caught up in the things of this world. You start thinking the worldly thoughts. You start getting too much into CNN and Fox News. You got to repent because <laughs> they can get your mind going this direction. It's like, no, Jesus says this. I don't care what these goofballs keep saying. I'm going to follow the Lord. And so we repent. We humble ourselves. All repentance is, is you stop going this direction because it's the way of the world, and you go back to doing it God's way. It's not for salvation. 
It was before you got saved, but now it's for close, intimate relationship. We know the, the Apostle Paul encouraged the Corinthians. Remember the Corinthian church? 1 Corinthians is a corrective letter because they are blowing it. They were doing all kinds of wrong things, so he corrects them. And then in 2 Corinthians, he tells them about repenting, and he's rejoicing because they did repent. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. Paul writes, Now I rejoice, not that you were made... I skipped one, sorry, but that's okay. We're in 2 Corinthians 7. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. That's a good thing. For you are made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, maturity, fullness of salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Again, Satan condemns us, and that produces death, but the Holy Spirit convicts us, that draws us closer to the Lord, where we experience life. Worldly sorrow simply passes off sinful behavior as, oh, it's no big deal. I can live the way I want. But that's looking at the blood of Jesus as a common thing that grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit within us. But godly sorrow should grieve our hearts and it causes us to be humbled before God and ask Him to cleanse our hearts and renew our minds. So we overcome by the blood of of the land. So that's number one. Number two, we see in this verse, they overcame the devil by the word of their testimony. What is your testimony? Hopefully you believe what Jesus Christ has done for you. You, you trust in what the word says about his salvation, what his blood has done for you. You have a testimony of how you once were in this world, living in sin and rebellion against God, but now you have a testimony. Jesus loved me, and he saved me, and now I'm his, and I'm going to heaven. That's your testimony. Satan does not want you to share your testimony with anybody, but included in your testimony is the gospel. Yes, I was, and when I talk to people, I'll, when I hear their story, and a lot of times it's like, yeah, I was the same way. I did the same things. But let me tell you what Jesus did for me. And if he can save me, he can save you. If he can set me free from these things, he can set you free from these things. That's a glorious testimony that he has given each one of us to share with those who are still lost and dead, dying in their sins. That he wants to set them free, that he loves them. And he wants to do the same in their life, what he has done in our lives. When you look at the Apostle Paul, um, six times he gives his testimony in his writings. We see him give it in the book of Acts a couple times. We see it with Timothy. He gives his testimony with the Philippians. But he'll always share, this is who I was. And you go through the fact that Paul was a Pharisee, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. But he had Christians, Jews, that became believers in Jesus. He had them arrested. It says he had some put to death. He had them imprisoned. He broke up families. That's what the Apostle Paul was before he became the Apostle Paul. So he always talks about, this is who I was, but let me tell you who I am in Christ. He has made me a new creation. He, creation. He's forgiven me of all of my sins. I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. And he always lets people know it's all about Jesus. Jesus came to save sinners just like you, just like me, just like that person out there you're witnessing to. So we all have a testimony. So don't be ashamed to share what Christ has done for you because Satan's going to come along and he'll say, oh, you blew it again. He doesn't love you anymore. Oh, you had those wicked thoughts. Jesus probably isn't real or he can never love someone like you. No, we testify that Jesus can radically save and change anybody. And when I look at my past where I was and where I am today, all the glory goes to the Lord because I know what I am apart from Christ. I know who I am in Christ. And that's a glorious testimony because when you give your testimony, here's an important thing to remember. Don't make it all about you and how horrible you were because I've talked to some people. Let me share my testimony. I said, okay, so 40 minutes, it's all about how wicked and sinful they were. Then you got a little 30-second tagline. Yeah, but Jesus saved me. No, put the emphasis on Jesus. 
his grace, his mercy, his love, his compassion. Yes, that he could save a wretch like me, but also always make Jesus the emphasis of your conversation. So you overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony. Then the third thing, notice here in verse 11, they overcame Satan because, and this is very important, they did not love their lives to the death. In other words, they're not only prepared to live for Jesus, they're also prepared to die for Jesus. Think about that. That's loving your life unto death. That's living for Christ unto death. Now, when that reality is within your heart, that you're prepared not only to live for Jesus today, but to die for him today, if necessary, the enemy doesn't have much power over you. I mean, I know I'm going to die, or the rapture is going to happen. Either way, I'm going to be out of this body soon enough. If I die, if I keel over up here or get hit by a Mack truck on the way home or whatever it might be, I'm not bothered by the fact that I'm going to be with the Lord forever. How I die, yeah, I don't care about that so much, but knowing where I'm going when I die gives me such a peace, such a confidence. So many of you know Rich and Deborah Coates, and I keep Rich in prayer. Ten years or 12 years ago, when we were going to go to Israel in 2010, they were all signed up to go, and at the very last minute, two weeks before we're leaving, he got cancer in his throat. And it was aggressive, so they did chemo, radiation. I was with them in the hospital when I got back, and it was brutal. It was horrible. And he got over it. He got better, but it came back a couple weeks ago with a vengeance. And so he's literally uh, going to see the Lord shortly. I don't know when, but so pray for him. But the neat thing is, he knows where he's going. When I talked to Deborah, she was like, he's excited because... He's done. He's tired. He's ready to go home to be with the Lord. And when you have that attitude, what can Satan do to you? You know, we're dead to ourselves, but we're alive in Jesus. So what do we have to fear from the enemy? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, another verse you're familiar with, says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. You've overcome them? Yes, listen. Because he who is in you, that's Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world. Paul says to the Philippians, Philippians 1.21, this is amazing. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Again, the worst thing that the enemy can do is take me out physically, but I'm going to go home to be with Jesus. Pretty good. That's a great promotion. And again, when you have that attitude, you don't worry about dying because you know where you're going if you're truly born again. So, dying to ourselves, alive for Christ, so important. On the other hand, if you love your life first, if you love the things of this world more than you love Jesus, Satan has you caught between a rock and a hard place because then you're always going to be trying to hold on to everything. And not only will your life be filled with compromise, if you love yourself more than Jesus, that is simply called idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatrous people do not make it to heaven. This is why Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We're dead to ourselves. We're alive in Christ. And when you have that attitude, Satan has no power over you. When you look at the apostles, after Judas committed, you know, suicide and he dies, and but if you put Paul as the twelfth apostle, eleven out of the twelve apostles all died horrible deaths. They had their heads cut off, crucified upside down, you know, they were tortured, beaten, they went through horrible things. The only one that didn't die of a as a martyr was the apostle John, who wrote Revelation. That's why God kept him around. But those guys knew to live is Christ. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to be a witness for Jesus. To die is gain. That's why they couldn't be stopped. That's why God used them in such powerful ways. They were going for it, not concerned about the here and now, but living for eternity. Jesus told the disciples, and he tells us, and this is what he said just before he ascended back up into heaven, 
in about seven days from when he ascends, he tells them on the day of Pentecost, this is what's going to happen, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So take note of that word witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. The Greek word is martis. That means a martyr. You're going to be my martyrs. You're living martyrs for Jesus. That's how they looked at their lives. I'm dead to self, so I'm already a martyr. And if they put me to de death physically, well, then I'll be a physical martyr. But they already knew. And we need to know that we are witnesses for Christ, living martyrs for Jesus. To live as Christ, to die as gain. When Christians have that kind of attitude, Satan has no power over us. So I encourage you, read, meditate over verse 11 here in chapter 12. You are empowered by, you overcome Satan's lies, his deceit, his temptations, when you stand upon the fact that you overcome by the blood of the Lamb. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm forgiven. I am... You know, I've been given this testimony of who he is, what he's done for me, where I'm going when I die, and the fact that I love Jesus first and foremost. It's not about me. It's about living for him. They did not love their lives to the death. Well, look at verse 12. The Lord says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, because Satan has been kicked out. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And so we'll be rejoicing in heaven at this time. Uh, the people on the earth, it says this is a woe because now Satan knows he's got a short time and Satan is going to focus his attention on stealing, killing, destroying as many people during the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. This is why it's called a woe. His hatred, his anger is so great because he knows he has a short time, three and a half years, to do what he's going to do. And um, it's going to be brutal, especially for the Jews. Look at verse 13. Now when the dragon, again that's Satan, saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman... That's Israel, who gave birth to the male child. That's Jesus. As we saw earlier in this chapter, the woman is Israel, and Satan is going to attack the Jews full on. He's going to try to wipe them out, annihilate them. Uh, somebody said, oh, you're anti-Semitic because the Jews are going to go through another Holocaust. That's what you said, and it is. I'm not anti-Semitic. The Word of God tells us, that when the Antichrist goes in the attack, he will destroy two-thirds of all the Jews on planet Earth. Only one-third will make it through. But of that one-third that makes it through the Great Tribulation, every single one of those Jews will turn to Jesus as Messiah. That's good news. I mean, that's not, I mean I'm not anti-Semitic in the least. I mean, that's what God's Word reveals to us. God never breaks His promise. He will fulfill what He says He's going to do. So look at verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And so what we see here is a picture of the Jews fleeing from the wrath of the Antichrist. Satan is going to use the Antichrist to try and destroy again all the Jews but notice they're given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness. Now, what does that refer to? It's not getting on 747s. Uh, the, the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. And we're told what this means. Um, we're given the definition of this flying on eagle's wings. It's when Moses is on Mount Sinai. He's about ready to receive the Ten Commandments. And then God reminds Moses what he did, how he delivered the Jews from their bondage in Egypt. Uh, it was the Lord who brought them safely through the Red Sea. And this is what God tells Moses, Exodus 19, verse 4. 
You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. This is God's way of saying, I am your deliverer. I am your protector. I am your provider. I am your savior. I will keep you safe from those who will try and destroy you. So here in verse 14, we have Israel fleeing into the wilderness. And it says, God has a place prepared for time, time, half a time. That is three and a half years. Daniel uses the same terms. We're also told it's 1,260 days. Again, three and a half years. We're also told 42 months, three and a half years. God will protect them for that amount of time. Now, this corresponds to exactly what Jesus said would happen to the Jews when they realize the Antichrist is not our Messiah. He is the anti-Messiah. And Jesus gives us warnings and he tells the Jews in the Olivet Discourse, it's a message to the Jews, when you see this, flee. And watch. What, and we saw this before, but look at Matthew 24, starting in verse 15. Jesus gives the, the Jewish people some very important details about their need to flee. Speaking of this time frame, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, when you see... The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. So what do we need to understand? Once again, the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist, who at the beginning of the seven years, allows the Jews to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. The abomination of desolation is halfway through the seven-year period, three and a half years in, he will go into the temple and say, worship me, I am God. And that's when the Jews are told to flee. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. The Apostle Paul refers to this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when he says the Antichrist, the son of perdition, goes into the temple and says, worship me, I'm God. So that's the full story we need to understand. So when that happens, Jesus goes on to say, then let those, when you see this to the Jewish people, let those who are in Judea, Israel, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is on the, in the field not go back to get his clothes. So you see this sense of urgency in what Jesus is saying as he warns his fellow Jews to flee. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And here it is. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So there's the reference to flying on eagles' wings. Well, I pray that your flight is not in the winter or on the Sabbath because obviously in the winter it can be much colder. On the Sabbath is a problem, obviously, for the Jews because Sabbath, every Saturday in Jerusalem, in Israel, everything shuts down. Many Jews won't flee because they don't want to break God's law by taking too many steps. So that's why Jesus says, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. He's talking to the Jewish people here. And then um, he says, for then, after that abomination of desolation, there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, the Jews, those days will be shortened. So again, those days of the great tribulation, they're shortened by the second coming of Jesus Christ. We'll read about it in chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Jesus comes on his white horse, and we, his saints, the bride of Christ, follow him on white horses, and then he'll bring an end to the great tribulation. So why the urgency for all the Jews to flee Israel? Because that is when the Antichrist is going to be completely possessed by Satan. He's going to try to annihilate all the Jewish people. Again, the good news is Satan is not successful. The bad news is two-thirds of the Jews won't flee. They will be killed, but one-third will flee. How do we know this? It's Zechariah chapter 13, starting in verse 8. This is the Lord speaking to Zechariah. It shall come to pass in the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it will be cut off and die. But one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. 
they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. And so that'll be a glorious day because all those who escape, they're in, um, we'll talk about it in a moment, but wherever they escape to, when Jesus returns, the first place he comes is to Basra, which is right outside of Petra. And that's, I believe, when the Jews are going to see him. And every Jew is going to recognize this is our Messiah. Zechariah 12.10 says, Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. They will mourn for him as a mother mourns for her only son. They will ask him, where did you get these wounds in your hands? And he will say, in the house of my friends. According to Romans 11.25, Paul says, All Israel will be saved at that moment. So every Jew, when they see Jesus returning at his second coming, will receive him, and it's going to be glorious amazing scene so look at verse 15 here israel flees to the wilderness well a third of them do for three and a half years time times and half a time so the serpent that's satan spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood so he's going after that remnant that flees but the earth helped the woman, Israel, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon, Satan, had spewed out of his mouth. So again, this is all part of the great sign the Apostle John saw in verse 1. But this is clear. The, the serpent, Satan, is trying to annihilate the Jewish people, so he goes on the attack. And what kind of a flood does he bring? We don't know exactly. You'll hear it is an actual flood of water. Some will say it's a flood like an army that he has pursuing the Jews into the wilderness. Maybe it's a combination of both. I don't have a clear answer on that. But whatever the enemy brings against God's people, God will miraculously intervene on their behalf. It says the earth will open up and swallow up that flood. Has God done that before? Yep. We have two great examples. Remember when the Jews get to the Red Sea and they're pinned in, Pharaoh's army's coming against them. Stretch out your staff, Moses, and he stretches out his staff. God parts the Red Sea. They go on dry land, and then Pharaoh's army follows, and then God brings the Red Sea over them, and they all drowned. So God can do it. Another example, though, is with Korah and his rebellious men that were fighting against not literally fighting, but they were coming against Moses and Aaron. And so they have this standoff. And this is what we read in Numbers chapter 16. Maybe this is what happens, how God opens the earth and swallows them up. Starting in verse 31 of Numbers 16. Now it came to pass as he, that's Moses, finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. goes on to say, and all those standing around were terrified. <laughs> Think so? I mean, Moses standing there, the earth opens up, all 250 people fall in the hole. God closed it up. So somehow God's going to open the earth. It's going to swallow up this flood, however that looks. And then he's going to close it up and he's going to protect his people. So no matter what kind of flood or trial or whatever way Satan is coming against you, you're protected. God is for you. God loves you. You are safe and secure in God's hands. Satan can't do anything to you unless God allows it. But God is for you. He's not against you. The Lord is our shepherd. Remember Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And then you get to chapter 23, or Psalm 23, verse 4. Check it out. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You don't have to fear the shadow of death. You don't have to fear when the enemy's coming against you because the chief shepherd, Jesus himself, watches over you. His rod, his staff, they come. What is the shepherd's staff? 
You've probably seen pictures of it. It's really tall. It's got a big hook on it. Very tall. So what does he use that for? Well, if one of the sheep starts to wander away, pulls it back. That's a good thing. And the Lord loves he disciplines. Also, if wolves show up and they want to go on the attack, he'll use that and beat the wolves away. That's a good thing. We're safe and secure in his hands. So the Lord is our shepherd. We don't need to fear the enemy. Look at this verse in Isaiah 59. I love how it's, um, what it says here. Isaiah 59, starting in verse 19, it says, So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, that's the east. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So when the enemy comes, the Lord lifts up the standard. Jesus stands between you and whatever's coming against you. And that's that old saying, you know, if a hundred are coming against you, just remember the Lord. Jesus and me makes a majority. Doesn't matter how many come against you, the Lord is for you. It's wonderful to know that we are safe and secure in his loving hand. So where are the Jews going to flee? A lot of speculation. I personally believe uh, Petra. Uh, we went there a few years ago when we went to Israel. We went to Petra in Jordan, and it's an amazing place. Um, but this is what it says in Isaiah 16, verse 4. So we know they flee out into the wilderness, and God says, Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab. That's present-day Jordan. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. That means the devastator. Sounds like the enemy. For the extortioner, the enemy, is at hand, or is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. So God will protect them, possibly there in Petra. Daniel saw the same thing. Daniel chapter 11, verse 41 and speaking of the Antichrist, it says, He shall also enter the glorious land, speaking of Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. Again, this is by the Antichrist. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. The interesting thing, those ancient countries are all present-day Jordan. So I believe the Jews are going to flee somewhere there in Jordan where God will protect them. Finally, verse 17, And the dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, there's only two groups of people that keep the word of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, and have a testimony of Jesus, and that's 144,000 that were sealed in chapter 7. We'll read about them again in chapter 14. And then those who are tribulation saints, they get saved and then they're put to death. So the Antichrist will go after them. So be that as it may, I'm not fully, I don't fully understand verse 17 here, who all the Antichrist is going after. But the bottom line is, whenever the enemy comes after you, you have, you have got to stand on the promises of God's word. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb. He's washed you clean. You're a new creation in Christ. The word of your testimony. I'm going to believe what Jesus has done for me is true. I'm going to hold fast to his promises that he's going to, He's preparing a place for me in glory. And that you don't love your life to the end. In other words, you're living for Jesus. No matter what happens, you're in his hands. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Let's stand together. All right? We're going to do something we normally don't do, so stand together. And you're like, Jeff, you're getting weird. What are you doing now? We're going to read these verses together and let these sink in because this summarizes pretty much everything I've been talking about, who we are in Christ, what he's done for us. And it's simply from, Rev uh, from Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. So let's read these together. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all, 
how shall he, him, also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, conquerors through who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, the thing nor means present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.